From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub and Wang Guan in Beijing. Following the third plenary session of the 20th Central Committee of the CPC, a resolution was passed to deepen reform comprehensively to advance Chinese modernization. Now, with key economic reforms and the strategic directives unveiled, what will be China's priorities going forward? And as China enters a new development era, how will the global economic landscape be impacted? To discuss all these issues and beyond, I'm very honored and pleased to be joined at this hour by Jegos W. Kolochko, former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Poland. He's now a Professor of Political Economy at Kosminski University in Warsaw. All right, Deputy Prime Minister Kolochko, uh, so good to have you with us. First of all, what are your major takeaways from the third plenum of the 20th CPC Central Committee? Which economic reforms proposed during the communique do you find most um, consequential to the Chinese economy in the foreseeable future? My experience as former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance in four different Poland's government and also my theoretical knowledge as professor of development economics is that it is wise to have long-term aims, long-term targets, and then propose the medium and short-term means, instruments towards uh, implementation, achievements of these targets. And from this perspective, I'm taking a look for the uh, decisions of the third plenum. There is the long-term vision, and I want to stress the term vision because sometimes in politics there is much more illusions than visions. The uh, steps, different steps on the structural side, institutional side, policy sides are just uh, seen as the instruments to the long-term development, which I see designed in a correct way. Very important is not only just dynamics, how fast, how speed economic growth or in a broader sense development, but also the balance. And I think that at that stage of changes of modernization, balance may be even more important than dynamics. In the long run, it is almost impossible to sustain high speed of growth Therefore, it is correct that the plenum has uh, exercised one more time the quality of development, but just not only the pace. But we know that more important is the next stage, implementation, the concrete details to have it dynamic and comprehensive. My next general conclusion from my experience is that long-term policy is sensible only when it is comprehensive. And that is what I see precisely in this uh, document. It is comprehensive. This is the very good side of the document of the resolution. Right, sir. What policy statements and what reform statements picked up from the communique uh, do you find most um, promising in terms of boosting the Chinese economy, which is obviously slowing down? And also to think about the job market and, you know, 16 million college graduates entering the job market every year and also taking into account the, the global dynamics of great power rivalry and uh, protectionism worldwide. There are two main um, aspects. First, and that is what I'm stressing quite often in my writings, in my lecturing, that... Uh, the cause of the great historical unmatchable economic success of china over the years was the art of combining the power of market with the power of the government so the combination of market and government is the recipe for the success of china's economic progress so far and it is also a recipe for the future Therefore, I was taking a look precisely what the document, what the authorities are going to do as far as enforcing, especially the market side of the exercise, uh, are concerned. I'm not sure because that depends on, one more time, on concrete details, how much more of market deregulation will be uh, in the years to come in the China's economic uh, mechanism. 
I think, and that is the also lesson from my experience, it is dynamic. There is not a fixed, uh, rigid proportion, how much of invisible hand of market mm -hmm. and visible, sometimes too much, hand of the government. It is flexible. It depends on the local, regional, country, international, global situation and reading of these conditions, how to adjust the relation between market regulation and government regulation is a question which will stay with us in each day, week, month and year till the next plenum and after that. But for the time being, I think that the general direction of more market at, at the same time, improvement of the governance of the public sector is a right track. Deputy Prime Minister Kolodzko, you studied emerging economies uh, post uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. You compare different models and uh, stages of development. You said uh, you're attracted by the Chinese model of growth, uh, the Chinese path to modernization. That is a key word during the third plan of the 20th session of the CPC, uh, appearing numerous times uh, throughout the session and also throughout the years. What does Chinese modernization, Chinese path to modernization, uh, mean to you and how China has fared in comparison with all those other societies? We haven't used that often, the term modernization in our Polish case. Also, when I was at the helm um, of coordination of microeconomic policy and uh, reforms, we were talking more of structural reforms, institutional uh, building that is setting the rules of the game and my program is known as Strategy for Poland. So I'm taking a look into China modernization also through this prism. I see it as a kind, a sort of strategy for China. Of course, China first, but with getting involved in the global economic affairs. And that is for myself as macroeconomist and political economist, the most exciting part of China policies and China modernization, how China, China's economy is adjusting to the grassroots initiatives, to technological change, to uh, requirement for adjusting institutions to new social and cultural and political environment, but also towards the wider context of the world, how China is getting involved in globalization, because China is so huge a country with 1.4 billion people in terms of purchasing power parity already number one, even bigger in terms of purchasing power parity economy than the United States and soon uh, will match also on the basis on exchange rate, the American economy. So China could be more oriented inward. And I think it is a right choice of policymakers that taking care of well-being of Chinese people and competitiveness of China's company, China is taking a look outward, how to take irreversible to my uh, knowledge, to my understanding. Mr. Uh, Kolodzko, on China's opening up further, Chinese leadership made it very clear that they're committed to uh, opening the country uh, further to foreign investors and foreign travelers. If you look at China's unilateral uh, waiver of visa requirements for citizens coming from, you know, now maybe two dozen countries, uh, three dozen uh, even uh, around the world. They come to China with visa-free travel opportunities and then now China travel is a buzzword uh, on Chinese internet. Uh, you've been to China a couple of times. Um, how do you see the potential of China becoming this tourist hotspot going forward? One of the best uh aspect of China's model, which uh, is mixing one more time, the power of market with the power of governance is uh, opening. China has engaged in globalization in a very smart way. When I'm teaching my students at Beijing University or in Warsaw or at Yale, USA, whatever, I'm saying that I cannot point to any big country which was able so successfully 
in so smart way to take advantage of ongoing globalization to its economic expansion, economic growth. China wouldn't be what China is today in terms of economic productivity, of standard of living, of well-being of uh, Chinese people, if not smart, intelligent uh, engagement, involvement in globalization over the recent decades. To sustain the significant, the fruitful pace of economic development, China must stay open and be engaged in the world. And from this perspective, I'm also a distinguished professor of Belt and Road School of China, Beijing, a normal university. So I follow what is being done within the framework of Belt and Road Initiative. This is a very wise, a very pragmatic, and you can see it. I do travel the world. I explored 172 countries most recently. I've been to such different countries like Timor-Leste, uh, Chad, or most recently, um, Tajikistan. And I can see in each and every of these countries and elsewhere, and also here in Poland, China economic activity, not only trade, but transfer of technology, engagement in uh, research and development, investment in infrastructure, and uh, now, not a, one more time, not everybody is happy with that. First of all, United States. Actually, my reading is that over the several years ago, United States has declared the kind of the Cold War against China. And one aspect of this Cold War, to which I refer as the Second Cold War, is trade war, is economic discrimination is just talking about the world-based rule, but acting against these rules within World Trade Organization by imposing uh, an extremely high import tariffs, which is the case of both United States and to lesser degree of the, United, of the European Union. Uh, I wouldn't say as economists that it is the fair competition. It is unfair competition because simply the mighty United States are not able to stand Chinese competition on very different fields. And instead of trying to get engaged on the basis which China uh, proposes so-called win-win globalization, they are retracting the process. There is more of tariffs, protectionism, um, and other negative elements which make the global situation worse. Talking about uh, America's stance towards China, do you think the China phobia and the American fever for beating down, for containing a near peer, and in this case China, previously it was Germany, Soviet Union, Japan, and now China, is that phobia of China? Is that insistence on beating down a, a, a close rival, number two, justified? Why do you think the American elites along the Beltway in Washington is so passionate in doing this? Not for one year, two years, or one decade, but for decades and even centuries on end. Yes, this is the phobia. This is something what on the ground, on the basis of common sense, of economic rationality, and definitely from the perspective of the global affairs, is ill-advised approach. Why they behave in the way they do, including part of the economists, uh, unfortunately, I think that simply because they are still surprised, if not shocked, by the speed of China's progress. After the end of the first Cold War, at the onset of the 90s, the world was led by the United States. But to be the leader of the world, one has to take care of the world needs. And that was not the case of the United States. They were simply using globalization to facilitate the needs of uh, United States, of their business and their society. And then there was a very fast rise of China. And sometimes they just wake up, they got up, that, well, take a look, we are losing our primacy, our hegemony in the world, and now they are trying to sustain it, accusing China of several misdeeds, uh, there is plenty of unobjective opinions, etc. And 
This is very bad also, I think, in the long run for American economy. So this sentiment is uh, taking into advantage, being used as a kind of economic policy instrument. And from this perspective, I think that much smarter, better, but still far from perfect is our, I mean, European Union approach. I was at the helm of Polish economic policy when we joined the European Union 20 years ago. And if we will take a look for these 20 years, we, the Europeans, we have behaved quite differently than the United States. And uh, some politicians, including Polish presidents, including Polish government, but uh, what is maybe even more important, President of France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, because France is much bigger economy and much more influential within the framework of the European we are saying that we should, we, the European Union, not take a side in the conflict between United States and China. And actually, I'm saying even more. European Union is a part of both Euro-Atlantic and Eurasia. In Euro-Atlantic, by all means, United States is the leader, and it will remain so in the foreseeable future. Sir, we've seen the European Union taking steps against China, you know, recently, most recently imposing higher tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, uh, a number of anti-subsidy investigations, so-called. Do you think Europe will follow in lockstep uh, with the United States? I hope no. Uh, again, there is politics and there is economics. And economics is based on different rationality than politics. Sometimes the policymakers are simply wrong from an economic perspective, but in a democratic system as we have, they have to get support of the majority of the people. And you must be aware that in several European countries, there is uh, an expansion of, um, of phobias, of um, populism, of nationalism against immigrants, against other countries. And for that reason, the policymakers are sometimes trying to protect the economies by short-term means, for instance, tariffs and so on. But we have now, we have had the election to the European Parliament only a couple of days ago. Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, who also visited China more than one time, uh, has become chosen for the leader of the European Union for the next five years term. Now uh, we have the new parliament and they are discussing who will be the commissioners of this or that aspect of the coordination of economic and social and financial and trade policy within the European Union. So we have to wait a little bit till the dust will settle and after this political fight to get a this or that position between individuals, between the fractions, between the parties, between the countries, within the European Union will continue, there will be plenty of this uh, also sometimes xenophobic, uh, anti-globalization, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I think that in the longer run, the European Union will find the way to better coordinate the economic development policy with China and definitely will not take the position, anti-Chinese position of the United States. To what extent it will be sympathetic to sustainable, peaceful, co cooperative economic development, it remains uh, to be seen. Yeah. Again, it is depending very much on the leaders and we must see who will be in charge of trade policy, of competitive, competitiveness policy. Mm -hmm. But I'm positive. I'm positive because I see much more pragmatism in the coordination of economic policy in the European Union than in the United States. So let's discuss the issue. We do need much more professional contacts, much more professional, professional calm debates in the media, as for instance, our talk Talking about China-Poland relations, the Polish president recently made a state visit to China, uh, talking with the Chinese leadership, talking about the BRI, talking about trade and increased uh, trade connectivity and commercial relations. Um, how do you evaluate China-Polish relations right now and where do you see it going? 
Well, you are asking me the question, how do I value? You know, I'm a university professor, so I teach my students and at the end of the sem semester, I have to make the evaluation on a scale from two failed to five. Perfect. Maybe it is four means good or four plus, four and a half. So there is still a place to improve the relations. First, we Poland, we were not keen to follow the Americans. We have a good relations with China. You mentioned visit of President Duda recently to China. He was in uh, several places, not only in Beijing, where he, he met with the Chinese leader. I've been recently in May uh, to Harbin, very interesting city in China, and visited the university over there with the lecture. And there is a group of students at the Faculty of, of Slavic Languages, and these young people, they study, they learn Polish language. It's another aspect. This time, it is a soft, uh, I may say, aspect of Belt and Road Initiative, not the hard one, infrastructure. The relations, Poland, um, China, the economic one, are good. The trade is growing, yet, of course, we do have a very big trade deficit with China. So our main concern is how to raise Polish exports to China. And we do it step by step. The situation does improve. So what I'm very much concerned about, this is the narrative about China. If you are following Polish media, I'm in minority. Polish media are biased towards this xenophobic, xenoskeptic attitude um, under the maybe American influence, maybe because they do not travel that often to China and they don't understand what China is and how China mechanism is working. So our relations are, are good. And I think that we, being the most important country among the new members of the European Union, we should pay Poland a more active role within the European Union to improve the, the relations between the European Union and China. To some extent, it takes place, but definitely not as fast as it could and should. If I was in charge of economic policy, and as I was four times in four different governments, and uh, definitely I would put on the Chinese uh, card much more attention than the current government. So if it is only four, let's improve it. Let's try to make it four and a half because nobody's mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah, hopefully it'll get to four and a half and eventually five soon between China and Poland. Uh, Professor Jagors uh, Kolochko, thank you so much for your insights. We learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN and Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.